Yes, and we're back on another episode of the Celtic Unrestricted View podcast, a podcast for the fans, a view from the stands. My name is Ryan Crawford, and joining me on this guest podcast is former football agent William Glavin. For the listeners who don't know William, um, as I said, he's a former football agent, currently working in recruitment, and his knowledge is really, really invaluable to a lot of people, and again, he's going to have the podcast. Um, Robert was meant to be on this week, but can't make it. Um, but joining us um, is the guest, Jamie Boyle. Um, again, Jamie's written fantastic books. He's been in crime documentaries. He's wrote them. Absolutely brilliant. Um, he's been on before. But the main reason why he's on, um, he's just currently wrote Alan Thompson's autobiography, A Jolly Boy. Um, again, get his uh, books set on Amazon online. Absolutely fantastic offer. Jamie, nice to have your mate house things. Oh, God, I'll, I'll um, full steam ahead. Uh, um, Tomo's um, got a really busy schedule. <clears throat> he's um, got lots of evening whiffs. Um, he's just been doing these last couple of weeks. Uh, he's got stacks. Um, he's doing one at the end of this month with um, Martin O'Neill, Larson, Sutton and Hartson. Um, so he's going to be on Talk Sport next week with Ali McCoist. Uh, I can't say too much, but he's going to be um, in the biggest paper in Scotland doing a certain thing. Uh, he's, um, yeah, he's, he's going to be, a lot of people, a lot of them, um, a lot of the Celtic fans will maybe have forgot about Tom Moore for maybe a decade or so, but he's back with a bang. And um, I'm just really happy and delighted I've had the opportunity of doing his um, riveting life biography uh, and hopefully it's the first of many footballers um i know i'm meeting didier gat in a week or two um spoke to many other footballers um so hopefully it's going to be a long you know i've kind of done true crime and uh completed it if you like a bit sick of the death threats and no good for my anxiety and all that so i want to ch- kind of change over into the football world and uh Hopefully, there's lots of football books to come. Because obviously, says Alan Thompson, um, big hero of mine, and I think as well, William, can I maybe a, a big hero of yours as well? Because again, that was more in your time, obviously. Obviously, I'm only a young man, but I think it was obviously more of your time. You're trying to say here, by the way. I'm only 28, so. Um, no, but, I want to kill me. For me, growing up, Alan was phenomenal. Um, I still thought yeah. that. Maybe in the Scottish game, I don't think it gets the accolade they deserve sometimes for what he did do for Celtic and for what he should have got for England as well. I think, um, yeah, I agree with you, mate. Like, I'd, I'd went to games, I was a team ticket holder through that whole period, um, went along with my dad to a lot of those games. That team was phenomenal. Didier Agat was another player who was phenomenal for us that, that Jamie just mentioned. That, that would really be an interesting story, that, because he, he came from out of nowhere to, to sign for Celtic and became a big, big player at Celtic. But, yeah, to go back to Tom, Tom was one of my favourite players at the time. Um, he always scored important goals for Celtic. I don't know how he'd done it. I'd lo- love to ask him. He was always there at the right time or he was always pulling off the right shot. Or He scored so many good, important goals for us and he was a, a key player for us on that run to, to Seville as well. I obviously, of all, I think I was maybe eight or nine. Um, I, I know, obviously, Jamie's obviously had a lot through 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 obviously the book as well. Um, obviously, Jamie, of all, for any Celtic fan, was a phenomenal time, and obviously, probably hearing the stories from Alan about that must have been really kind of brought to hear, especially doing his book. Uh, yeah, do you know something? I mean, I was twenty three, and it was the greatest time of my my Celtic supporting life. Um, I mean, you know, he's a fact for you. Yeah. Along with Larson, Thompson was voted by the fans as um, the greatest player in that whole tournament. So, obviously, he scored the goals against uh, <clears throat> Liverpool, um, yeah. Stuttgart. Uh, yeah, I mean, other, other big games, um, Bayern Munich. Um, yeah, he was just a, just a big game player. Um, it was. And, you know, it was... I think I got talking to him about December last year and uh, I kind of put it to him um, and, you know, I was, as I think I told you the last time, Ryan, I had to play it, I was playing it cool, pretending I wasn't as desperate as I was. Um, You know, so to get someone like Alan Thompson in my first football book, um, 
you know, I mean, the forward written by Martin O'Neill um, is like, wow, Martin O'Neill written that. No disrespect, but it's almost like um, poetic. Um, oh, it's, it's magical. And, you know, and you think, yeah. yeah, wow. You know, and it, it's and it, it opened a lot of doors to me. Um, I've spoken to so many people. There's a lot of tragedy stories, a lot of funny stories, particularly with um, Chris Sutton and Ali McCoist. But um, yeah, Thompson was a big, big game player for Celtic. Uh, he, you know, 26 old firm goals, sorry, tw <clears throat> 26 old firm games, seven goals, three red cards. He was um, iconic along with Baldi. Lennon, Petrov, Lambert, Sutton, Hartson. Oh, you could go on a gat. Um, you know, and it's the nearest I think we've ever got to a team like that was um, oh, um, and Musa and the Rogers. Yeah, yeah friends the of Rogers. Rogers team about yeah. 2017. Um, you know, didn't quite do it in Europe, although we did it domestically. And um, it, it was just an amazing time, beating Barcelona and and um, Alan Thompson. He um, he epitomised that team from 2000 to about 2005. Yeah. And as you say, he's obviously working with Martin O'Neill. Um, the stories from Martin O'Neill and obviously working with Thompson, for me, it would have been amazing. But for the fact that you'll, you'd actually been with them and you've heard that with a book... Like seeing these stories and hearing them second hand, that must have been phenomenal. And as you say, Mark O'Neill phoned the book, like, come on. <laughs> yeah, do you know, I, I often joke with my wife because um, obviously these last, this this year, oh, particularly the last five, four year, I've had to meet, meet and speak to a lot of villains, boxers, um, footballers. And uh, I don't, no disrespect, but I've got to speak to people like Alan Shearer and all that. And, you know, when, when, when I started looking at my phone and said to my wife, look at that, Martin O'Neill's phoning me. I was like, I mean, you know, I felt, I felt like swearing. I'm like, I've, I've had pictures all over my house of this guy. And now I'm, I'm starting buying him slices of cake and coffee. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking to him about Celtic and he's, He's just wanting to know about true crime because he's fascinated with true crime in Martin. <laughs> um, he's um, particularly interested in Jack the Ripper and um, because he was training to be a barrister. I think I told you that before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah, I've heard that um, as well. Yeah. So he's, very, he's very switched on with his um, true crime. Um, and, you know, in 1981, he went to the Yorkshire Ripper case at the Old Bailey. Um, so Martin's a very, a very intelligent guy and I'm sat there overawed with him and he's just wanting to talk about my books and I'm thinking, are you having a laugh? <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, to, I've got to be very thankful for Alan and um, I'm always extremely grateful that, you know, um, I mean, I've got 21 books out now, uh, nine Amazon bestsellers, but I'd never done a footballer's book. So he took a gamble on me. Um, yeah, so, you know, I'll always, I'll always be grateful and, I've got a lot of love for him. Um, you, know, you know, his personality off the pitch mimics. Um, on the pitch, he's kind of fiery, uh, a bit hot-headed, reacts and thinks later. Um, but I think that was what made Alan Thompson the player we all fell in love with. And, um, you know, yes, he was born in... <clears throat> yes, he was born in Tyneside, 140 miles away from Glasgow. But... You know, he was kind of gallus. He could play a bit. He knew how to lead the boot in. He knew how to wind up the opposition. Um, you know, I'll just... I'm, I'm not going to go <clears throat> into the book because um, Alan will go mad. But um, Scott Brown said to me, uh, playing Celtic back in that day was just horrible. Um, he said it was a team full of monsters. Your Baldies, your Hartons, your Valhallens. You stand Vargas, and then you had Thompson with the biggest mouth, hmm. who who was causing riots and winding everyone up. And uh, when you know, if there was any kind of ruckus, uh, Thompson had been in the middle saying, "Do one wee man, you've got nothing. 
you know, and, and kind of, you know, he was just this, you know, um, Scott Brown said I hated him, absolutely hated him with a passion. Um, playing against him, we used to kick lumps. And I think a lot of people will get that because Tom Thompson was just that kind of player. But obviously, walking with Jamie Caesar, people would have been kicking lumps at him on the park. But for me, that's a good sign because he's a fantastic player and they don't like him being against him. So you can't, you've mm. got to take that as a compliment in a way. I would, definitely, I think you would. And I vividly remember Alan Thompson having battles every Rangers game with Fernando Rickson. That was every single game at one point. I'm pretty sure the two of them get sent off in one game, if I remember right. Um, having a Barney in the middle of the park. But, um, um, yeah, yeah, I think I, I think that uh, I do remember him being that character. But the team, is, as Jamie quite rightly said, the team is full of those sort of characters and that's what made them special. And I think that uh, Martin O'Neill built the the right team at the time with that sort of character and that sort of mentality and that's why they were so successful definitely and that's why they dominated Scottish football anyway Definitely um, again we will touch on uh, the book again Jamie because I know Wogan's got a few questions to ask you in the book um, but obviously yeah. as you say you're an author Jamie um, plenty of books done a lot of kind of crime stuff and obviously growing up um, when did you feel that you had the talent to be an author when did you think oh this is the type of can I route I want to go down and then how did you feel it was kind of growing up and going, do you know what? This is actually the thing for me. Uh, do you know, funny enough, I was 36. I left school with no education. Um, and I watched a documentary in 2012 called Paul Sykes at Large. Um, so I've become obsessed with that, absolutely obsessed. Um, and I spent three years wanting to learn who this Paul Sykes was. So I watched a documentary about 80 times read the book a few times, um, spoke to a few authors. Uh, no one would have wanted to do it. So I just thought, can't be that hard. Buy a dictaphone, <clears throat> walked into the city of Wakefield. Um, and uh, let me think. Um, so I started the project 2015. So three Amazon bestsellers on um, and a multi-million pound film and documentary to start next year. Uh, it's kind of fairy tale, but I would have done them books for free. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know anything. I just knew I had a passion for um, bizarre, strange, weird characters. Um, Alan, if you're listening, that's not a dig, although I do find you're a bit, um, you know, he's, he's a bit, <laughs> he, we get on being Alan, he's a bit, um, he gets me, he got me before he met me. And uh, I don't want you to know, tell him, I, I don't want you to tell him stuff about Alan and think she's weird now. <laughs> yeah. Um, so then it was, you know, I'd done the first two Paul Sykes books, I'd done a boxing book that kind of flopped a bit. And then I did a book um, on Lee Duffy from Middlesbrough, um, and that went absolutely viral. Now, to tell you how big that went, um. Middlesbrough Waterstones had 30 stolen in the first month. Oh, it was um, the most successful book ever in the history of Middlesbrough Waterstones in 20 plus years. Wow. Um, that's when went crazy. And um, I just accidentally become an author. Uh, you know, I'd done a lot of true crime, done a lot of bad people, had a lot of death threats. Um, you know, even though um, a lot of my books support registered charities, there's always someone saying, you know, what, what you're doing, doing about him and you're glorifying him. And so, um, you know, I'd, spoke, <clears throat> I'd spoken to footballers, um, not as big as Alan Thompson, and uh, I thought I'll start off. Um, and obviously, 2005, 2006 saw the birth of Neil Lennon, Stillian Petrov, John Hartson, Chris Sutton. Um, even Martin O'Neill's had a couple of books on, on him, although he's never done them. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Alan Thompson, I just put it to him last year. Uh, and I kind of, I could see the cogs thinking in his head. And uh, I just offered him a deal. I knew it couldn't be matched. Um, you know, you know, Alan, I hope he's not listening. But, you know, at the start, I would have done the Paul Sykes book for free. Um, and I probably would have done the Alan Thompson one because it was like, 
you know, I, I've been to an evening with John Hartson and an evening with all these ex-stars. And uh, to sit, sit and listen to Tom Moore for, I think I recorded him for just under 21 hours. I thought I would sit and pay to listen to this. And I'm actually being paid to listen to it. <laughs> and, um, you know, even now, as the book's just on the print, he's telling me all these funny stories about sleeping with Chris Sutton for hours when they're cuddling and they're not aware the other one's there. I've heard that one, I... <laughs> I'm thinking, why didn't you tell me all these stories and, you know, all these stories of bloody, you know, this Celtic player wanting to kill the other player and, and then, um, oh, Bobo Baldi um, putting the wrong petrol in his car. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> right, you could imagine this, rather than take it to um, a garage and get it done, he actually put a pipe and siphon the full petrol all out. That guy is just a terminator, just a machine. <laughs> um, oh, unbelievable. And that's a true fact. And I spoke to oh. one of um, uh, one of the top, top reporters the other day who confirmed that story. Um, yeah, so lots of, you know, just kind of Glasgow goldfish ball mentality. Um, obviously, Fernando Rickson, God rest him. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you brought her up, William, William, um, Tomo yeah. and um, Fernando were literally like Tom and Jerry. As soon as it, as soon as they saw each other, it was just on site. Yeah, you know, yeah. I'm mallet at each other and um, rocks dropping on each other's head, and you know, they uh, they had an extremely healthy rivalry. Um, and the book just completely, um, and Alan's, um, Jordy. Body voice just talks, just you know, everything it goes into the full lot. Um, you know, so I'm just gonna have to wait to uh until the book comes out for you all to read it. So obviously that's what that's what Morgan was wanting to ask you Morgan it, but how you obviously you got got in yeah. contact them. Yeah, but basically, Jamie, obviously you you've obviously done a lot of books on some interesting people over the years. Where where do you where is your starting point? For, for the book itself, is, is it a matter of sitting down with someone and, and recording and trying to get as much out of them, or is it going and checking them out with other people in their network, etc.? Yeah, um, I spoke to a lot of people over the years, um, and I, I, I sat down with um, a former detective inspector, and he said, Jamie, the way you do your books, he said, that's how we interview people for murders. So what yeah. you do, what, what you do is you kind of, um, you get the skeleton of the life. You start at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes I like to put the ending at the start. Um, but overall, it's kind of like a skeleton. On a, so if I put Alan Thompson's bones on a piece of paper, yeah. um, you know, if you can imagine a compass and you're lost in a jungle, uh, it's a direction. So when we do something called the book plan, which probably takes about two or three hours, um, that kind of gives us a direction on what we want to talk about, what we don't want to talk about, uh, legally, yeah. what we have to be careful about, stuff that will just get us outright sued and they'll never work again. Yeah. Uh, stuff, particularly in this book, um, stuff that probably would have got Alan Thompson shot. Um, you know, he's obviously been involved with... Um, some um, extremely high-profile cases mm-hmm. around the media, particularly with Neil Lennon and, yeah, you know, life, um, life's in threat. You know, uh, Osman Warnings, I think it was. Uh, you know, bullets in the post, and you know, these 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 yeah, are yeah. these are really serious things. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Thompson himself um, has had various incidents in Glasgow over the years. Uh, where his life has been at risk. Uh, you know, I spoke to um, Aidan McGeady not long back, and he said, um, he said, you know, when, when, I'm, when I meet people in Glasgow, I'm cautious. And he said, sometimes people think I'm being miserable and I'm a bit standoffish. Mm-hmm. But what I'm trying to surmise and sum up is, is this guy going to come and cuddle me or is this guy going to come up and want to fight? So that's, mm-hmm. <clears throat> you know, it's not just the Celtic, it's... Um, it's obviously both sides in Glasgow mm-hmm. 
Yeah. And, um, you know, anyone, anyone who stands for Glasgow's big two, uh, I think Ronnie Dyler was pretty vocal about it last couple of years. He said, when I, when, I, when I joined Celtic, I lost my freedom. But it was all worth it. You know, mm. most of them live on the outskirts, Edinburgh or somewhere. Um, you know, and even if you're a complete no one and just a footballer, whoever you sign for, whatever side of the fence, you're now uh, a target, whether mm. you like it or not. <clears throat> yeah. No, that's too well, man. Um, as much as... People, people who don't really know the ins and outs of football, they think they're just footballers, which they are, but when you sign for Celtic or Rangers, it's the added pressure of outside life, and that's one, and that's maybe one reason why some players come to Glasgow and don't do well, because they can't cope with the outside life. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that, obviously, as Jamie mentioned, Eden McGeady, that he's, he's obviously from Glasgow, so he, he knows what it's all about. It must be, must be strange for guys coming from England or coming from abroad and, and not being used to that, and Listen, as you, as you said, it's the goldfish bowl up here in Glasgow, isn't it? When you play for Celtic and Rangers and there's a lot of pressure on you and, and from both sides you can get it as well. So um, there is a lot to take on. So, yeah, I, I can't wait to read, um, obviously, the, the book that Jamie's done. I'm sure there's a lot of that in there. and um, will be a, a good, interesting read for us. I, as you say, Zane McGeady, um, I know he's obviously, because now he played for Ireland and he had all that and stuff, so... And that's just one player, as uh, Jamie says, you've got Thompson, you've got other players, and it's too big to say, Jamie, that it's, it shouldn't be able to happen in football, but I think when it comes to this side of uh, the city, it's just, uh, it shouldn't be part and parcel, but it just kind of comes with playing with Celtic Rangers, and you need to have that character to kind of shut that out, but it must be very hard, and obviously you'll know we've talked to yeah. Alan that it must be really hard to actually continue to play at the level he did, and obviously have that, the stuff that happened, but... The fact that he did, it shows you how big a character and strong man he is. Yeah, you know, Ali McCoy said to me, he said, listen, he said, some boys, right, from Italy and Spain um, and even England, they'll come up and they'll think, oh, this is easy, <clears throat> you know, and uh, they just can't hack it. Um, and then you get the likes of Alan Thompson, um, of... Oh, there's so many, you know, I mean, I mean, some of the names he mentioned, Terry Butcher, Chris Woods, Graham Roberts, yeah. um, you know, obviously before your time, Ryan, mm -hmm. but he said, you know, some just got it and some were born to do it. And Alan Thompson was one of them. Um, you know, it was the biggest derby in the world. Millions are watching. You know, we've all seen the players like... Um, I mean, Janino's first game, he got man of the match, then he disappeared. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, Justin Flo um, for Rangers. There's been so many over the years that have talked a good talk, like Joey Barton in particular. Yeah. Um, and they've just went missing in action. And then you get the players like the Thompsons, the um, Moussa Dembele's, the Lubos, the Henricks, the Suttons, the Hartsons, um, even on the other side, um, Ross Wallace, the Nacho Novo, um, they were they were prepared to fight down in the gum shield and stand in the trenches, and you know they knew what it meant, even though they weren't Glasgow boys, mm -hmm. um, and they're the ones who were really accepted forevermore, <clears throat> and. Um, you know, I was talking to, to Alan's missus a couple of months back. I think it was weeks back, actually. Um, and he'd just done three nights, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Um, and she said, I had no idea. One half of the city wants to just adopt him uh, and buy him all the drinks and just kiss him and cuddle him. Um, and the other half just want the head in the garden. Um, and then Glasgow is a special city. Um, I'm not going into it too much, but, you know, um, th there's a chapter in the book, in Alan's own words, um, and I've got to say it's, um, I want to sound a bit like Martin O'Neill here, when he says, extraordinary, extraordinary, do you know after the Juventus game? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I remember that. 
man, man has a way of saying, magnificent, magnificent. And once you read that chapter in the Geordie Boyd, it's just about, it's just about what Alan had heard in Glasgow and he'd watched the games. Um, he watched the 6-2 game the day before he'd come up. Uh, and then he walked in uh, and he got sent off in his first game. And Martin wanted to beat him up. And then the <laughs> next game, you know, you know what happened. He scored the winner and everyone loved him. It's, you know, it's just um, an unbelievable. And anyone who, for both sides, whether you're Celtic or Rangers, you will really relate to that chapter. Because obviously, um, William, obviously, we have been up here quite a lot with obviously Jamie's down south um, and stuff, so we obviously see more um, about obviously because only the city and players can up. And obviously, you've dealt with players um, who yeah. might have come up for maybe down south or whatever on their field. And um, it just shows you that it takes a certain character as well as a certain, I, I, I would say, I, a certain character to come up here and do well. And I think you've got to be at the level as your Thompsons, your Suttons, and your Dunbarries. To do it because, as Jamie says, Joey Barton came up, who was let's I know I would say the city, but he was, he's been a very solid Premier League footballer. And he came up, and I want to say he was finished, and he came up and didn't do too well. But you've just had to just realize at the moment, Joe Hart's come up, he's been about the same age. And look at him, he's he's he just looks like he took, took Celtic to a duck to water, yeah, he definitely has. You're right, I think you need to be the right character and have the right mental strength to, to come up here and perform for either side of the of the divide. Um you're right, you know, there's players come up here with good pedigree, good good talent, good ability, and they've not done it. Um, so I think it's um it, obviously at that time as well, I think Jamie touched on, you know, you had guys like Tori Andre Flo coming up here, Premier League top Premier League striker and, and couldn't do it. And I just think that at that time as well, there was a I think football's changed quite a bit. We've spoke about about as about this before as well, Ryan. I think back then players were more resilient. I think Aaron was probably a resilient guy. I think your Hartson was a resilient. All these, all these guys that played then, even I'll say the way like your Barry Ferguson's and yeah, your Galberts and all these guys, they were all resilient people and they could they could handle that pressure. And I think more, more and more now you see young players coming through who don't have that sort of same resilience. And I don't know if that's a generational thing, but I just think that's changing the game quite a bit. Because that, that kind of goes back to the story that uh, can you like you mentioned the other day about the wee boy who signed for Aye, when he signed yeah. that kind of reverts to that story. Yeah. Then, when you're younger and these days they're kind of pampered, they don't want to do the dirty work, they don't want to work hard and knuckle down. And I don't know, yeah. I, I still personally think that's missing for us as a Celtic squad. I think technically we're very good and we're very. Hi, but we're just it's all technically gifted players, but I think we're missing, like Jamie says. Maybe Scott Brown was the last guy we had that that type of kind of dying breed. But your Thompsons, your Hartsons, your Suttons, as Jamie says, that team were just, I don't want to be rude, but they were full of monsters. They were horrible B A S T R T S. They were horrible think, people on the park. But I think I heard, it's just a I heard Craig, yeah, I, I'm sure I heard Craig Bellamy in an interview before and said that when he came up to Celtic, when in that dressing room, he was like, holy shit, it was like a team of men. And it was like, what if I got myself in for here? Do you know what I mean? I've got to do the business. And he said, if you didn't do the business, fucking Tomo or Big Hearts and a Lennon, they were on your case and they were on your back and making sure you were performing week in, week out. And you're right, I think uh, a lot of teams suffer from not having people like that in their team, but um, a lot of players will go and hide nowadays, wouldn't they? Whereas guys at Craig Bellman would go, right, I need to get my finger out here, I need to do, do the business. So, yeah, it's interesting to see how much it has changed quite a bit over the years. Because obviously... Um... <laughs> I mean horrible I'll swear horrible bastards I mean they just went to win the game for 90 minutes mm -hmm. they'd done everything to win the game if it was elbows pulling shirts a big tackle and I think Jamie obviously it's, you mentioned Scott Brown I think he was maybe the last person we've had obviously in this team you've got your McGregor's and you've got your obviously Vickers now they've got guys who so are strong in a, in a tackle but I think as William alluded to there it is a bit of dying beating what you says um, and I don't know obviously you watch a lot of Football, football down south. Do you really see that happen as well? The football's getting more technical now. Um, do you know what you're talking about? You're talking about listen that that generation of Martin O'Neill's team. I mean, even players like Stephen Pearson. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. oh, you, you know, um, and then a couple of years after, your Paul Hartley's, your Barry Robsons, 
Um, and I think you're, you're very right, Ryan. We really could do with um, proper free, really characters who, you know, um, epitomise that Martin O'Neill kind of, um, your Joe's Val Harlan's, they were, you know, these were like, you are Mialbis, these were proper yeah, nasty yeah. Um, mon monster men's, um, you know, and I think. Um, a lot of it's just slowly drifted away to the point where you know we could really do with um, so a Neil Lennon type kind of but sat in the back four, snapping at everyone's heels, yeah. arguing, and like Thompson being horrible. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I, I personally think that's one of the biggest things in the Celtic team missing. Um, and, you know, Scott Brown, I think he had a cup, I think he had two. Two, two good seasons left in him. Um, I think it's a massive cry and shame he left. I think he could have done it and, he, and he's continued to do it. So um, yeah. this season, arguably Aberdeen's best player, hands down. Uh, and I just think, you know, cry and shame, but you know, he, 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 it was his decision and he deserved it. But I just, uh, I don't know where Andrew's going to get them kind of nasty characters. Um, them characters that kind of put fear in the dressing room. Because um, Thompson talks about that in his book. Mm -hmm. um, you know, kind of like he would have screaming arguments with Paul Lambert because, the you know, a certain back pass and once it was off the pitch, it was forgot about. But it was that winning nasty mentality. And I think it's really missing from the Celtic side. No, I, I agree. Um, 100%, I think. I love the fact that, like my mention volume, they've got obviously uh, Jamie. I'll touch on with you with some of the players um, sooner in the podcast. But volume we spoke with Jota and guys like that. Mm -hmm. It's good. It's good having the guys in your team. But as Jamie says, you need a bit of dig in the middle of the park. And I, I think maybe sometimes we're a bit too lenient that way. Like when there's a bad tackle, it's just all right. Okay, it's a bad tackle. But I, I've seen recently McGregor looking a bit more and referees' faces and stuff, but I don't know if that's because he's been told all fans to do that, because even last season we lacked that, and I don't know if we still lack it, and I don't know, as Jamie says, where we're going to pull that kind of player fate. Is it for the G League? Is it going back and getting one Yama now because he's came, he, he says he's about to come back? Is it, I think one Yama would be ideal for us. I know he's, he's only 30, I think he's only 29, 30, he's no past it. Guy like that, I think but Jamie's right, well, we, we didn't need that. I'm not saying we need it, but me personally, I think it would maybe just... Solidate the team. Yeah, I, I think it's um, I think it's a hard thing thing to find now in a player. I think um, those there was there was an abundance of those players 15, 20 years ago. I think, and you saw that in the English Premier League as well when you had Vieira and Keane going at it of the Arsenal Man United <laughs> game as well. Um, you know, Shearer liked to get in about it as well when he was playing for Newcastle and Blackburn, etc. So I think I think football's changed quite a bit. I think it's really difficult to find those sort of leader types and those guys that have got character and not afraid, you know, like Scott Brown, not afraid to tell you when you're, you know, doing something wrong and getting on your case about it, putting the fear into people. So, listen, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I think if, if Ange feels we need that, he'll go and get it. I, I did hear Victor Wanyama had said that he would, he was a bit regretful the way he left Celtic, etc. But obviously money talked at the time and that's why he had to go. But I did hear he was interested in coming back. So, I suppose we just need to see what happens in January. There's obviously Scott Brown, uh, Jamie. I'm not sure if it's in the book or if I've gotten the right fact here, but did, um, did Thompson know say that Scott Brown was unbelievable? He was real. He was, I believe I believe that Scott Brown still doesn't get the plaudits uh, they done at Celtic. I thought technically he was very good. Um, even with Aberdeen this season, he's doing technical stuff and Aberdeen fans are like, wow, I'm like, he done that every week for us. <laughs> it's not a big, it's not <laughs> a big surprise. I was a big, big admirer of Scott Brown. Um, I thought it was superb in some of the, the slack he got. Um, I know we're going to have topic, but we'll mention them. And I think that I'm sure did Thompson no say that Scott Brown was very underrated and people didn't realise how good he was. Obviously, he worked him every day at Celtic, so he obviously epitomised how good he was. They absolutely hated each other till 2010. Um, but of course, I think he had um, two seasons, maybe three. Uh, of coming up against him. Uh, I think he met him as a, a 17, 18 year old as Hibbs. Uh, and, and Brown 
would purposely go up and uh, kick lumps out of Lennon and wind him up. And he thought, who the hell is this young? You know, but it was just like, uh, you know, you couldn't help but admire him. But when you turn up the Celtic team, you know, you were badders, your your Jotters, your Kyogos. Um, I mean, one thing I spoke and I mean, I spoken to. Let me get this right. I think 25, 26 people for this book. Uh, some major names: your Alan Shearers, your um, Bruce Riox, um, yes. Alan Stubbs. Uh, oh, it's just everyone from Thompson's career. In other clubs, and they all say mm. one thing: he was fucking horrible. He was the biggest whinger. He was just wouldn't <laughs> shut up. Um, he would just argue in an empty. He caused a fight in an empty house. Um, yeah. And and that that really, you know, I mean, Martin wanted to sign him. Um, nineteen ninety seven, nineteen ninety eight, I think, when he was um, at uh, Leicester, and he was at Bolton. And he thought, what a player he is. He said he absolutely took us apart, um, single-handedly. And I thought, and uh, obviously when Tomo flopped at um, Villa 2000, uh, he thought, I mean, I think he was Martin's... I know he signed the same day as Didier Gatch. It might have been his second signing. But he, he knew as soon as he got that job, he thought, I'm going to get this kid. Um, I'm just trying to think how old he was. 26 then. Yeah, he was. Um, Villa signed him for just under five million, and I think Celtic paid it for 2.75. Absolute snip. That's a bargain, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, is. did, Jamie, did did Darren understand what he was getting into when he signed for Celtic? Did he did he know a bit about the club? Obviously, from the North East, you didn't get a big following down, down those parts, don't you? But did he understand what he was getting himself into when he signed for Celtic? Can you just pause it a second, lads? I'm just letting my dog out because she's crying. So can you just edit this out, Ryan? Yes, I, well, when you were saying that, obviously, um, about Alan getting... Can up here. Signing for Celtic. Yeah. yeah um, did, sorry did about that. Sorry about that. Viewers, Jamie's dog was away for a period, so we're back to it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, um, obviously, I can uh, ask a good question, one, because I'd like to know that as well. Did they actually know what he'd be going into when they came to uh, Celtic? Um, right. Well, Alan's parents, uh, I think one's a Catholic, one's a Protestant. He was aware of the situation. Um, Alan was. Best friends with um, a, a, a guy called Tommy Johnston, a Geordie. Oh, so he yeah, always yeah. told him what it was like. Yeah, I remember him. Um, Alan Stubbs was there at the time. And obviously Alan had watched football forever. Um, he played in a, a Newcastle Sunderland game. Uh, he, I think he'd had a, I'm not sure Bolton's derby is, but he'd had a few like Lancashire derbies. Uh, he, he was once um, sent off for Newcastle. He stamped on someone in typical Thompson fashion. <laughs> um, he had an idea, but to answer the question, it was up to a million times more than what, what he thought. Um, yeah. You know, he did look around stadiums and think, fucking hell. You know, he he um he scored seven goals against Rangers, sent off three times. Um, you know, getting sent off the second and the third time didn't get any easier. Fifty thousand fans laughing at you, um, all waiting for you to get on the bus to laugh at you more. <laughs> um, it's like no derby in the world. No. And. Uh, yeah, you know, it's um it goes into extreme. It's more than a game. And um he didn't really I don't think anyone really unless you unless you're a Glasgow boy, yeah. um or you you know, you maybe grew up on the streets of Belfast, I don't think you can fully acknowledge you know, the penny doesn't drop until that final whistle and you hear the crowd and you know he if you look around at his teammates and you think, Jesus Christ. Um, and that's what a lot of the English players, um, 
Jamie Carragher, Michael Owen, Stephen Gerrard, to name a few, have all put in their biography um, as, as just the, what the hell was that? You know, and, and that's only at Celtic Park. Ibrox can be as equally as intense and then um, that cauldron of hate. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, nothing is not nothing equals an all firm derby to answer your question. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's 100% um, some of the some of the biggest games that I've ever seen um, as a Celtic fan. Um, obviously, obviously, some of the the games, the build up is phenomenal, but sometimes the games are a bit kind of poor. Same as down south in Man City, Derby, in the United, it gets build up all week and it's a no no draw, and you're thinking, oh, but I think most of the time up here, eh, William, even if it's enough for each draw, there's always talking points in it, there's always something that happens. There's never, <laughs> there's never a game where, oh, that was a decent point for the two teams, there's always something that comes up. <laughs> I don't, I don't think I've ever heard a Celtic Rangers fan call it a decent draw, ever, but in, any, in any shape or form. Um, but no, I, th I think you're right. They're, they are the, some of the biggest games, uh, and big, one of the biggest derbies in the world, by without shadow of a doubt. And I think that, um, as, as you said, there, Tom will be sent off in quite a few a few, of the, few of those occasions, obviously three times, but he also scored a lot of good goals. I can remember some of the goals he scored when, um, when I was in Celtic Park at that time, or even at Ibrox. Um, but yeah, to, to, to do the business in those games, and obviously it must be it must be a big shock to some players walking out at Celtic Park and Ibrox in those games. They must be sort of starstruck for the first five minutes, and the game must pass them by. But um, as you said, the strong result ones tend to come through and become key players for for the team. And obviously on the book, Jamie, um, the wee question I like to ask is: she doing the book? Obviously, there must have been bits where you might maybe stolen. Do we do we put this in? Do we not put this in? What was the hardest part of the book? Was there any chapter in particular that there was maybe too much to put in, you had to edit it down, or <clears> there was stuff that you had to decide what to put in? Um, I've got to be honest here, and I've got to give Alan Thompson credit. And this isn't, you know, he is the only person ever, and I mean, I spent, I think it was 20 hours, 47 minutes with him for the recordings. And he's the only person um, in 21 books who's never avoided one question you know there was a lot of people that have looked at me as if are you for real I'm not answering that <clears throat> um, you know I mean listen you don't have to be um, you don't even have to know Alan Thompson to know that the guy's highly emotional um, he's highly charged and I think that added to his character in them games and you saw him getting sent off and screaming Blue Riot and fighting with loving crans and oh, everything. And, you know, um, I can personally tell you without divulging too much, I've, you know, Alan Thompson cried in front of me several times, mm -hmm. uh, um, laughed. He's very funny, by the way. He's got an amazing sense of humour. Um he is just someone who is constantly looking to take the piss out of you. Um, he's constantly looking to put a sticker on your back or um, just humiliate you. And, you know, uh, Aidan McGeady said some of his antics these days would be borderline bullying. <laughs> you, wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to get away with it with all these young players. But, you know, he, he said it was almost character building. Um, you know, you can watch your Simon Ferry podcast to know what Simon... Simon was a young lad. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, Simon... I mean, one thing Simon says on his <clears throat> on his podcast was... Um, I think it was him and Scott Cuthbert and Paul McGowan. And uh, the, these two lads, you know, they were doing the errands, 16... A couple of lads, 16, 17-year-olds. And Thompson walked past them and went, fucking hell. And he shouts all the first team. And he said, look at these lads in here. Look at these fucking ugly. Look at how ugly these lads are. And these lads are just looking like that, scrubbing the boots, <laughs> humiliated by the heroes. <laughs> um, you know, there's, there's a lot of them stories um, yeah. in the book. You've only just got a, you know, I spoke to Simon Ferry and he um, he was, he just, you could, you could probably fill a book on what Simon Ferry says about Alan Thompson alone. <laughs> Um, you know, so he's um, 
he's just that kind of character that, you know, wants to laugh all the time. Uh, but the book for the last uh, 30% of it is, you know, you've got to read it and think, mm -hmm. hang on a minute, is that for coming from the guy who's, who laughs all the time? Yeah. Uh, and as I said, I can't go into it, but a lot of it is about, mm -hmm. you've read the headlines, the, mm -hmm. the mental health issues, the, you know, the, the, the alleged affairs, the mm -hmm. alleged yeah. drink driving, all these things, that the, there's some strong stuff in there. Obviously, his rocky relationship with Lennon, can't go into that, but Alan, as I said, didn't avoid one question. Um, yeah, it's um, it's going to be certainly insightful. I don't think everyone will be happy, maybe with what certain things were said, but, you know, listen, it's, it's his life story. It's not mine. Yeah. Um, all I did was an author, and, um, I, you know, Alan just sat and bled to me, and I was a dictaphone, I was a computer, uh, so ultimately, it's the Alan Thompson story. But um, you know, I think I think is I think overall he played something like two hundred twenty-seven games, fifty-one goals. Um, you know, seven goals against Rangers. John Hartson only scored eight. Phenomenal, phenomenal record, and only seven goals were against Stefan Kloss. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so so them seven goals were in actually. February 2001, and the last one was August 2004. Yeah. Three and a half years. So that's remarkable, really, when you think, I think Moussa Dembele got six. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely astounding, but he was just one of them yeah. players who, you know, um, to quote Ali McCoist, he was someone, if Thompson ever get the ball near our box, you know, there was Bobo, there was a Bobo Baldi's uh, I won't name him, but someone said to me he would head it and, and God knows where it would end up. But Thompson was technically he was dangerous and he was one of the ones where you thought, oh, you know, I think Tom Rogic yeah. is one now. Mm -hmm. Something always happens in the games, whether he he wins a penalty or you know, he's and Thompson was like that. And um, yeah. you know, even from the Rangers side, he's a player who I mean, I, I get various um, enlightening messages from the blue half of Glasgow on Twitter. And, you know, I'm often getting called all these kind of names for, for the crime books. So I, I think it's brilliant for me that I'm now getting called uh, certain sectarian words. Um, and Thompson's always in it and they absolutely despise him. But whether you love him, love him, or you think he epitomises everything you hate in life, You've got an opinion on Alan Thompson. And, um, you know, and I think the Celtic fans just adored him. Uh, you know, he's a name familiar to millions worldwide. Um, and one thing that man did, he, um, and I want to, you know, I, I, I said to you the last time, Ryan, I was on, um, and I speak for Chris Sutton as well, is, you know, they did remarkable services to the club. Mm. And, you um, the, the exit was kind of out the back door. And I think they yeah. did better. Uh, you know, as I said the last time, Chris Sutton was at Celtic for five and a half years. And when he left, he said, I've had a great five years at the club. Now you can read into that, you know, half that year was under Strachan. Um, would, would them two have got the exit like that if Martin and Wally and Robbo? I personally don't think so. No. But um, I just personally, what this is going to be, I personally think this book is going to do massive, like, oh, as big as any book I've ever done. Um, you know, I've had the flops, I've had the books, a few hundred, and I've had the ones I've done tens of I've, I've never been so certain of a book. Um, and I, I knew that before. He even agreed. I, I sat and thought, your book would be massive. Mm -hmm. I know your book would get the attention of Rod Stewart, Martin Comston, John Higgins. Everyone remembers Alan Thompson. I spoke yeah. to um, a guy the other day. Um, he's good friends with um, a Glasgow villain called Ian Blink MacDonald. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, he's, a, he's one of Paul Ferris's close friends. So he's, a, he's a Rangers man. And he... Um, he's, 
God, I remember him. You know, so, you know, I, I personally would, I would like, you know, Thompson to get, you know, listen, yeah, he didn't, you know, I'm not saying he deserved a testimonial or some kind of game, but I think he deserved better the ending than what he got to. Mm -hmm. He sneaked out and just sent on loan and, you know, the last day, no one was even there. And, I, you know, it saddens me and it saddened me as a writer to write that. And I just think, you know, this is Alan Thompson's moment in the light, in the sun, and um, I hope he gets what he deserves. See, obviously, I don't know Andrew Roots, William. Um, you might know as well because you've been involved with Celtic with deals and stuff, but I don't know if it's maybe we obviously Sutton leaving. I think did Hearts know we leaving a bit of a bummer as well? They all, yeah, they all um, did, didn't they? Obviously, they I, think, did, I think we're trying to get the, old gen the older generation out. But do you think that's more to do with the board than it is the management team? Do you think it's more to do with the board getting them out than I it is the managers? Because, let's be mm. fair, the guys, Sutton, Hearts and Thompson, the way they left, it, it was, I don't want to be too cheeky, but it was a bit of a shambles. Um, for the yeah. seventh, the, the goals, the bottom under the club. And again, I don't know, was, it, was that the board more telling the management to do it? Because me, that's the way it looks for some of the dealings I've We've heard for Celtic, it's more downsizing for the club than it is actually wanting them out because they're bad players. Because they're only bad players. There wasn't it like Alan Thomas was 39. It was still a decent age to play for Celtic. So, was it more to do with the board than it was the management? Um, I, I really don't know. To be honest, I, I remember at the time that was when I was going to every Celtic game. Just about then, when, when Strachan took over and. It was almost like the changing of the guard, really. Mm -hmm. Stratton get rid of the, the old guard and bring in the new guard. And, and, and I, I do remember, I think, did, did Sutton not go to Villa, I think, after that? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Tom will get put out on loan. Hartson had left. Petrov was wanting to go and wasn't allowed to go and had a bit of a fallout with him as well at the time. And, uh, yeah, it was a bit of upheaval from the old Martin the old days. And I remember going to Celtic Park when Gerald Gordon Stratton took over and going, that's an end of an era. That Martin the Real team, that that's it now. That chapter's now closed. Do you know what I mean? And uh, which was a bit disheartening at the time, and it was hard to try and find those feelings back because that that team and, and, and Alan Thompson was a key part of that team that won his trebles and got us to Seville and done all these things. And um, I realised at that time it was the end of the era. But to be honest, I really don't know what the driving force was behind it. But it just kind of felt like the old guard was out and the new guard was in at, at that time at Celtic. I think that's the way it does seem. Um, and it's the way I obviously we don't know what goes behind the scenes, but there was I don't obviously I don't know if it's in the book. Jamie might obviously Jamie will go to it in the book, but I don't know if it's going to be in the book exactly why it happened. But can I just um, that yeah? that full everything you've just said there is all explained in great detail. Um and that's you know, but the certain people that you know, um, didn't like certain people and, mm -hmm. you know, your Ross Wallace's were coming through, your Aidan McGee's, your Sean Maloney's, that's just a fact. Um, yeah. You know, and Didier Gap was out and, and and it was very much when Martin come in, he got all John Barnes, Deadwood, as he called it. Um, yeah. You know, there was a few players, your Jeremy Ali Adiaz. Um, that's right, that's right. Adam Vodko. Ad Ad ah. Virgo. That's the only thing, in my opinion, uh, I could probably hold against Gordon Strachan. Uh, and that you know, bizarre, bizarre signings, wasn't there back then? There was some bizarre yeah. ones. Um, you know, there was the tried ones like your Paul Telfers. Mm -hmm. I personally didn't think more Kamara was as bad as was bad as that. Um, you know, he's a ref. He was good for one season. Um, I mean, everyone knew Pet Russell was gone at the end of the season. He was going to get good money. He was 26 yeah. by then. Um, he was going to be joining Martin. Listen, that's no secret. You don't, you know, at, yeah, yeah. you don't have to the book and all that. Um, but the only one who was kept from that kind of era, if you like, was Neil Lennon. Um, mm -hmm. And obviously, Gordon built his team around him. Um, and Lennon was gone from 2007. And you know, I mean, Bobo Baldi was, was gone for years before he was gone. Um, <laughs> That's right. Yeah, That's you know. Right. Um, 
it's very, very sad because, you know, Thompson yeah. um, in particular was, um, he was born in 73. There was a back, it was December. So when Strachan come in, he was only 31. Mm. Well, you know, listen, he was on, I mean, all I can say, it will go into great detail. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, no stone will be left unturned from Alan's mouth regarding that issue. Yeah. And obviously, William, um, to that, to this season, well, sorry, to last season, what happened and then now, um, under Ange, it's obviously, it's a total different kind of era for us as well now. Yeah, it is. Um, obviously, what Jamie was just talking about, and I'm looking forward to obviously reading that side of it, the book, because it's good to obviously get the insight from Alan's experiences in that period, which would be great. But yeah, obviously, to bring it up to now, Jamie, how are you? What was your thoughts on Ange coming in this season, and, and how do you think he's doing so far for, for the club? Uh, you've got to be brutally honest and realistic. He's done magnificent. Um, Listen, every Celtic supporter, anyone of half a brain, you cannot fault that man. Mm -hmm. uh, listen, you know, I mean, going back 2017, 2018, your, your Mooses, your, your French Eddies, um, you know, there was, there was millions of pounds worth of talent. And for some reason, all of them just disappeared. Um, and, you know, I think... Ange has had the hardest job for any Celtic manager since Mowbray departed. Um, obviously, Lennon come in um, early April 2010. Um, yeah. <clears throat> so, obviously, Tom O come in for two years. Um, yeah, but, you know, you've got to be realistic. Um, it's, he needs time, you know, I personally would like to see, I think Celtic, um, you know, there are a few, they've got a few kind of, to quote Alan Thompson, kind of poncy wingers, a mm. bit kind of dainty. You, you know, you need a few solid, you know, your Chris Sutton's, your big, horrible, ugly central defenders. So a big John Hartson's who, you know, Rio Ferdinand said he was my worst opponent. He said, I knew I was in a game. I felt mm. like I'd been in a boxing match. And, um, you know, whether the Greek lads can do that, I don't know, it's too early yet. But, you know, I personally think we're just too um, lacking that kind of, you know, kind of come on then, roll your sleeves up like Lennon had, Roy Keane, um, you know, Kyogo, your Jotters, your Abadas. There's, there's a, probably a few other ones, um, you know, but wear them. I think Victor Wenyama is six foot two. I'm sure he's 29 or maybe nearly just gone 30. Yeah. I think he could come in for a couple of years. Um, yeah, I think that that's um, my opinion. But to answer your question, William, I think I'd probably have to give him eight out, eight out of 10. Yeah. Um, very, very, you know, he's done really, really well with what he's had to play with. Um, and that's that. Yeah. Because obviously... Yeah. Um, but you can obviously know as well, William, with how many deals we've done in the, the window there. It was a lot to take in. I mean, obviously, Jamie as well will obviously realise how much he's done, as he says there, because he's, he's an eight out of ten. Is, he's probably right because he's come in, got 12 or 13 players, got some yeah. of the deadwood away, and there's still some deadwood that has to go away, which I think in January will, I think obviously, it's already, January's already set in stone, I think, for maybe guys like Yeti and Barcats to give away and free up some money. but I like this yeah. comment from in the papers. He basically says, we won't win that mess again. January will be prepared. The summer will be prepared. And I mm. just love everything about the guy. Um, obviously, I didn't know much about him when he came in. But just the way he talks, the way I think, obviously, I don't really want to talk about him, but outside the city, seem a bit chaotic the room. Obviously, the general leaving, financial stuff isn't looking good. So we just need to pause along. And I think we've got the right man at helm to do that and help us. Yeah, definitely we do. I, I, I'm going to just agree with obviously what Jamie was saying in his time. He's only had one transfer window. We need probably another couple to get it completely right. But I think you might see a change in what Celtic do in January this year. I think they'll try and do everything as early as possible um, and, and get players in the doors. Obviously, a few players were linked to it. 
I think Ange will be pushing for those deals to be done virtually right at the start of the window, if possible. Um, that being said, that doesn't always happen, as we've obviously spoken about in other podcasts, but listen, I think he'll be pushing to get it done um, nice and early. Because I agree with you, Jim, when it comes to Manyama, um, or that player like that, so Alk, I think we're missing. Um, as much as I, even last night, Scotland game, McGregor was unbelievable, but they all spoke about John McGinn. McGregor, didn't get, didn't, McGregor was just, I played well, but I thought McGregor was one of the best players in the park. I know every Scotland player was brilliant, but I'm just, for a selfish point of view, a Celtic fan, I was looking at Celtic players, and McGregor just, I, he's, he's always on the radar, even with Celtic, you don't realise how good he is until he's on the team, and then he's in the team, and that injection of pace is there, and I think he's crucial to what we do, but if you had him, as much as I love Tumbo and Rogic, if you had a one year next to him, I think it would it build the team a bit more. Yeah, I think um, Callum McGregor's definitely starting to flourish. But, you know, I personally think Ange um, had the worst possible start. And what I mean was, Eddie Howe, right, what that guy done, <clears throat> what he what he done to get a bomber through four flights, right? Um, you know, I mean, Tom Moore did his um, pro license. So I've listened to, there's a bit in the book about him. I've learned mm. a bit about him. Um, you know, I mean, listen, when Pep Guardiola goes on record and says, and his is one of the best coaches I've ever worked with, and I'm very much like you, Ryan, when you when you see him training, he's like, listen, guys, we never stop, you know, and, he, and he's, the man is, he's possessed, um, you know, he's, um, he just, he's done everything right, yeah, listen, there's been a few bad results, and I've even heard people say, oh, get him to fuck and all this, you know, yeah, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, you know, he's, he, he does need his own time. And uh, I noticed this week Celtic were classed as um, one of the best clubs in the world to I've seen manage. That, I've seen that. You know, I mean, listen, Neil Lennon should have been, I mean, I called my son after Neil Lennon. So there's no greater... Neil Lennon fan. Um, and he didn't go till February, but, you know, come on. He should have went November. That was the time. Yeah. You know, he maybe should have walked. but And I think anyone other than Neil Lennon would have, would have walked. Um, you know, but, yeah, he, 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 def he definitely deserves this season and, you know, certainly the, the chance to win a cup next season. Um you know, I, I certainly think all the signings, most of them, maybe the, the big boy, the central defenders, 50-50 at the minute. Um, right, Starfelt. Yeah. Starfelt, yeah. But, um, you know, I mean, that Kyogo, you, you know, and that, that big, the new Japanese boy who's, I've been watching him on YouTube and uh, you've only got to look at the Spurs striker, Son, Son is it? Yeah. Um, yeah. I think the some really a top talent over there. And uh, when Andrew spent the first spoken of, people were like, oh, he's from the J League. Oh, wait, give over. You know, he's Celtics fifth signing to desperation signing. And ever with the manager position, <clears throat> manager position had been gone for months. Eddie Howe was the man, then he wasn't. And Martin was coming back. Uh, I mean, I, I, I was sat with, <clears throat> I was sat with Martin in, in um, June. And it's really funny because I was, I mean, this is going to sound like a total bullshit story. <laughs> but I was sat in a pub in South London and on the telly on Sky Sports come up Alan Thompson and Martin O'Neill. And then about a minute later, Martin O'Neill walks in and I thought, but it was just a little clip from Sky Sports. And, uh, you know, I, I was kind of, to, to be honest, he didn't want to talk about Alan Thompson. He was more Jack the Ripper, Paul Sykes, Lee Duffy. <laughs> and I'm like, I was like, wanting to talk to him. And he's like, he was telling me all these stories about when he went down to Middlesbrough. And uh, he's got a great sense of humour as well. You know, he's, um, oh, he's, uh, you know, I mean, Tomo, I'm not going to divulge the book, but Tomo tells everyone, listen, when he spoke, he's kind of scary. Because he didn't lose it like some managers do <clears throat> all the time. He didn't turn on the ultimate warrior all the time. 
But when he lost it, he really lost it. He kind of had this Ronnie Chris there with his glasses. Um, and he had a deadly silence. And when I was, I mean, to, Tomo does a brilliant, brilliant impression of Martin. That's so funny. I watched a podcast, was it Under the Cross, man? Yeah. He's like, you know, <laughs> he does this, this um, yeah, he kind of, when he gets nervous, or when, when he has a rant, he talks and he, he puts his hand over his mouth and he's going to me, so Jeremy, oh, brilliant, magnificent books and all, and he's doing all this. And I'm just sat there thinking of Tomo. Doing the, taking the piss out of him. <laughs> and, uh, no, but he's a guy who, when we done the book plan, um, we discussed several. Um, there were some serious contenders. Now, what a, what, um, what a forward is, <clears throat> what a forward is for a book, is it should be essentially one to three pages, um, and it's the most famous infamous, notorious, biggest name in the world to glamorise your book. <clears throat> so Alan Thompson, you know, we had all kind of Alan Shearer's, Henry Larson's, but there was only one man. When we, when we made the list, no disrespect to anyone else, there was only one man, um, and Tomo absolutely loves him, dotes on him like a dad. Um... Uh, you know, they've got a, a great relationship. Um, you know, they think the world of each other. Uh, you know, he's, he's kept in contact with him. Um, a, a couple of years after Tomo retired, went to um, London, Martin bought him dinner. Um, you know, I mean, obviously I'm hoping to, um, to tie up another deal with Didier Gatt. And uh, he, was, he was another player who was exceptional, uh, come from nowhere, mm -hmm. disappeared after Celtic. But I can tell you, uh, and it's not even in the book, this, this is just talking to him. I can tell you this because it's not even in the book, but people will think who was Martin's number one guy, Chris Sutton, Lars. If, if, if a gap was fit, he was the main guy. <clears throat> and obviously a gap suffered from a lot of injuries. So Martin, Martin would, would kind of say, look, I'll arrest him against Falkirk away, but can I bring him in for Barcelona? And um, he was one of them players, did he, uh, where if you've been injured for a long time, uh, you know, someone like your, your Tomo would need one or two games to get up where he could be injured, or like Henrik when he had his fractured cheekbone. Yeah. You could just put you could just put yeah. him in straight away against Barcelona. Um he was he was um phenomenal. He was he was built like a middleweight boxer. And um you know um, could you imagine if someone like Paddy McCourt had had his fitness he wouldn't have been at Celtic he'd have been at Barcelona or Real mm. Madrid. He was just he was just an overall athlete one of one of the great scores I've ever seen. Um if you've never seen it, was Didier Gatt against Rafe Ro Rovers for Hibs? Yeah, I remember that. Oh, and he, I think he gets it from his near enough his own box. Just yeah. he's like, have you ever seen Roadrunner? Like Mimi, like the, the cartoons. Yeah. That was that. Yeah, yeah, hundred you know, percent. Do you remember Didier Gatt's goal against Ajax in two thousand one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yep. You know, and people people talk about Mbappe now and. You know, when you watch Didier running, you think you're not even you're not even actually going a full belt. Nice. And there was yeah. there was nobody could catch him. Um, and, and that guy come for twenty seven thousand pounds. People think it was 50, 50 grand. It was twenty seven thousand. Um, you know, you didn't really be. make it in France. Come over here, someone give him a trial. I think he was, you know, and and um, very sadly, I think he he joined Martin. And uh, I think he played six times for Villa. Went to back to France and he disappeared. Um, you know, uh, he was he's become a Celtic icon. Um, you know, he is one. I person. I mean, <clears throat> I've been obsessed with Celtic. My my first game was 1982, but the first the first season I remember 
was the centenary season. And uh, I mean, I just missed out on Danny McGrain. Um, but I can't think of a better right back in my time. I'm 41 now than a full fit Didier Gatt. Um, I don't know what you guys think. Um, from that day, for me, I obviously I'm a bit younger than you guys, but um, for me, I, I would, for, I, I probably say for me, it might be lustig. Um, for consistent levels, I thought it was very, very, very good. But I liked Hinko as well. Um, I don't think about Hinko Morgan, but I thought Hinko was very, right. very good. I don't want Keith to support it either um, for how good he was. Yeah. I think um, the Diddy gap was just explosive. I remember watching games and I used to sit main stand just to, to sort of along from the way dugout. So in the first half, he would run past you and you're going, wow, the speed of this guy. It, it was almost like the forest gump and you need to tell him to stop at the end of the pitch. Do you know what I mean? He's going to run up the stand. That was what it was like. And uh, he was unbelievable to watch. For me, Didier Regat would be for me and my team in, in front of those guys. Lustig was a great servant at Celtic. Andy Hinkle was a great player as well. But um, Didier Regat was phenomenal. And the thing that you saw with Didier Regat was he was explosive with pace. But as he was at Celtic, you could tell when he was coaching him, get that mm-hmm. final ball right, get the final ball right into the box. And then he was creating things and making things happen. He just became, a, a, he was unplayable at times in games. Um, and he did that against some of the best, mm-hmm. biggest clubs in the world. Then obviously, um, talking about um, players, we interesting back by the podcast, Jimmy, um, your best five-a-side team for Celtic, there's a lot of players we could pick. Um, but for you, obviously, who would you put in? Either it could be for certain reasons, formation, but... Right, yeah. So from, from 1998, um, so that's when I've been really switched on. I've watched everyone. Um, obviously, I've lived in Glasgow, times of my life, Scottish parents. Um, so, I've, you know, I'm switched on as can be. Um, so Fraser Foster would be a close second. But at the Burick, from 2005 to 2007 was world class. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. people were talking about Arsenal coming in for him. You know, yes, yes, he, the last couple of years, <clears throat> yes, he, um, he was over Freestone, overweight, and he lost Freestone when he left Celtic. You know, but obviously, you know, the Celtic fans, I mean, Arthur went public and he said, I was lazy. I was out drinking tea ski, um, cigars, loved the cigarette. Um, and you know, all he had to do was bless himself, and the Celtic fans loved him. <laughs> but he wasn't—he wasn't as good as the, them two years. He was better than anyone I've ever seen. He was. He was. Yeah. Um, uh, defense, defense-wise, uh, oh, I, I love Bobo Baldi. Um, I think it'd have to be Baldi or Didier Gap, but I'd probably go with Bobo Baldi. Absolute monster. There's a lot of Bobo Baldi stories in this book. Um, built like a heavyweight boxer. Uh, didn't say much, but um, yeah, they were, I, I don't think there was a scarier football player in Europe football, European football. You'll never understand why the Barcelona um, player motto. Uh, yes, uh, Attacked Baldi out of all nice. the Celtic players, players. <laughs> he, you know, he went for for Bobo, and and obviously That's people, right. you know, it was actually Rob Douglas who got sent off. That's um, right, so, so I'd have I'd have Baldi. Um, yeah. I'm not just saying this because I've done his book, but I probably would have Thompson because um, he it was very skillful. He was very technical. And uh, a five-a-side player, you know, I've asked Martin O'Neill as five-a-side, actually. But um, Thompson was, you know, he was underrated. Yes, he could take free kicks. He could tackle. He could deliver set pieces. He wasn't good in, his, in, the, in the air. But he was, he was quite good with his feet. And uh, so I'd have had him. And uh, up front, I'd have had Henrik. Um, and obviously my idol was, um, I think I've got a picture of him in the back, you can't see it though, Frank McAvenny. Oh, um, you know, he was, I grew my hair like him as well. But, you know, listen, when he left Celtic, <laughs> he was going down England in the top tier and him and Tony Cotty were, so yeah. when you think, <clears throat> obviously <clears throat> the Premiership hadn't, <clears throat> sorry, the Premiership hadn't ever had all the money then. And what McAvenny done, you know, well, I mean, I, I, I spoke to McAvenny 
Um, he gave me a follow, and he said, you know what? I'm actually bigger in the East End of London for, for the West Ham fans than I am for the Celtic fans. Um, and I thought he was one under it. He was quick. He was powerful. He could head the ball. Um, and, you know, I, I think he ended up at Celtic three times. The last time, you know, it's it's like Charlie Nicholas coming back. It was, it's just the name. Yeah. But, you know, that centenary season, um, you know, I mean, Andy Walker, I think, scored 30 goals for Celtic and 100 games. The 26 were in the centenary season. But I think McAvenny for that season was on fire. Obviously, Ryan, you probably weren't even born then, but William, yeah. can you remember that? No, that that's I'm 35, so I was pretty young when that had happened. Um, I, I actually my last memories was when Celtic were struggling but under Liam Brady. <laughs> um, yeah. After that period in the early 90s and Lou McCarry, that's my earliest sort of memory. Celtic and Red going Biggins, to Hampden Park. Hampton. Yeah, going to Hampden Park and Celtic was being built. That, that those were my first games, you know, Pierre Van Hooydonk and that same thing. Then things started to change at that point going forward. But obviously when O'Neill came in, that. That completely changed everything with the team he he built in. But no, some good players there, some interesting picks as well. I think McAvenny, yeah. My dad always goes on the front McAvenny. What a player he was. He was outstanding for Celtic, especially that centenary year. That was a good team that year as well. Mm-hmm. I will <laughs> um for me, Jamie, uh, there's only one guy can lead my five side team, it's Boric. Um an absolute he was an absolute hero to me. Um some of the saves and the penalties at Sparta at Moscow. And as he says, it was, it was generally world-class. Um, I, for in my time, I've really, really had two world-class keepers and it would be Boric and Foster for a season was world-class. Um, it was a dog's touch and go, I think, between the two for Celtic fans in recent terms. But Boric, I don't think we can speak him enough. Um, no matter what he'd done off the park, on the park, he was unbelievable. Um and then in front of him, I think a, a guy who I think I, I'd love him in my team now would be Mialbi. Absolutely a gorgeous big bastard, but <laughs> an absolute monster. Just big thighs, physical, just no nonsense. And I think I wouldn't have liked to play against him. Um, my midfield, there's Thompson, there's just, he's going to be in your team. Creativity, left foot, absolute wand. Um, but the guy for me who I think gets underplayed a lot um, is Paul Lambert. Um, he came to Celtic. You got a world class player for the price he got for was a joke. Um, and I thought for me growing up, um, I think <clears> Simon <throat> Ferry talks a lot about him, saying he just just watch him, and that was football. He was phenomenal. Um, and also <laughs> behind him you've got Larson. It's just you've got Sutton and Hartson and everybody else, but Larson for me, Morgan, it's just. Um, he can't know your team. No, no, I think he's in about every big fan team, isn't he? I don't think he can ever rule the king out. Um, but no, some some grand players over the years that have played um, at Celtic Park, and it's, it's always good to sort of reminisce on them. Uh, isn't it? Um, and obviously for yourself, um, what's your biggest memory um, as a Celtic fan? Um, I know we've spoken about it before, but I know there's probably a lot because you're a bit older than me. But what would you say is when you're your kind of best memories as a Celtic fan? Uh, no, welcome. Sorry. <laughs> oh, sorry, me. Sorry, me. Um, biggest memory is probably Seville, to be honest. Mate. Um, I was sixteen when I went to Seville. Um, I was doing my standard grades in school at the time, and the Wednesday of the final, uh, there was a maths exam, and I hadn't picked maths that year, so I had a study leave week. Apparently, study leave, <laughs> and I went to Spain for a week with my dad and uncles, and it was fucking amazing. <laughs> it's one of the best weeks of my life, even though the result, but. The way Celtic played and the way they fought back was just unbelievable. Um, and it was a joy and it was unbelievable the amount of people that were just in run about. We stayed down towards Malaga, everywhere all over Spain. People were coming from all over the world. Um, that whole run, all the way up to that final, I can remember pretty much every game. And I was at a lot of those games as well on the build up to it. And there was points it was just so surreal when like you're beating Blackburn, right? Great, then you're beating Liverpool. Right, we're going to beat Bo Vista, and in that last minute go with Larson, you're just like, fucking hell, this, this might just happen. Um, but obviously at that time, I think a lot of us underestimated Porto, and, and obviously an upcoming young Jose Mourinho who was coming through at that time, and they, ju- they just beat us that night, 
and we got so so close to it, and it was heartbreaking after the game. But that's definitely one memory that, that will stick with me probably forever. Um, oh. that whole run in that final. Talk about Seville. I can think I was about seven or eight. I can remember every time Watson scored, I was running about the street shouting the ball, and my dad's like, "Yeah, yeah, it's dark and watch the game." And that's my memory, and I, I can only vaguely yeah. remember that team, but. Um, Obviously, Jamie, you've obviously a bit older me as well. So, what would you say would be your, yeah, is it a mem- the best memory goal game? What would you say is obviously you've been through with the book with Thompson? There could be one in there, but um, I, do you know what? I'm going to put me in order. I mean, what I, my, I remember being at um, the 1989 Hampton Cup final, Joe Miller scored. So, I was there as a nine year old boy, um, obviously a bit young, just you know, um, but the two that really stick out for me. That, that I actually got a euphoric high uh, and had a come down for days was um, when Alan Thompson scored against Barcelona 2004. That was when I was going to most games, double figures a season. And um, I just remember going to work the next day, rough as Tarzan's feet, but thinking <laughs> Barcelona. And then probably my highest moment ever when I, I was bad for about five days and it was just like uh, Nakamura when he scored Man United 2006. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, that shoot. was just phenomenal and it was just like, you know, people say it's only a game and it, it's not, it's like, you know, football means a lot to me, it always has. Um, you know, yeah, you don't, you, I suppose you dealt with the, the cards you dealt with you know, your dad, yeah. where you're from, kind of. Yeah. Um, I lived in Glasgow <clears throat> when I was young, Scottish parents. So it was like, I didn't choose to grow up in England, have Celtic kids on and be abused. But it was braided me at a young age. And, um, you know, obviously these days, people are just supporting whoever's really good. But back back then in the 80s, in the 90s, it was who your dad, who your family, yeah. and your granddad and the one before. And, and uh, well, football has been, I've had some, you know, I mean, I've got to say, <clears throat> I've got to say, because this is a really good question, uh, and I'd like to ask you both. Now, obviously, I've finished Thompson's book. Uh, the Seville run, the losing the league in the last minute, 2003, yeah. was unbelievable, right? But you could look back that season and think, we've won nothing, but mm-hmm. with pride. Now, there's an s- extremely strong story which is going to raise eyebrows and the people won't be happy. Certain people won't be happy. But um, there's a chapter called The Gaffer's Last Stand, Fair Park, and I can't remember, but it's about 2005, losing the game, the league. Helicopter Sunday, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. No, McDonald 88, McDonald 90. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, helicopter turning and just oh. Sally Fan just being laid on the floor. Marvin Andrews for Rangers said it was God. <clears throat> and um, you know, what what Thompson describes in that book is like fucking hell. It's like and then obviously Martin announced he was leaving. Um yeah. but that's I mean, I just sat there, screamed at the wife. Went to bed for about four hours and just laid on the bed and just never said a word. Boycotted the daily record for months. And I, and I never, I'd never watched any footage for probably 10 years afterwards. But that really, like, that was just, you know, listen to people. I mean, I'm, my wife's just beaten cancer. Uh, that's devastating. But for, if anything, I mean, what's your guys, what's the moment which has really affected you? That, for me, was like, I went away the next day and just never said a word. So what's that yeah. for you? Um, in terms of, in terms of that, that probably, that brings back so many bad memories, Jimmy, when you talk about that game, because yeah. um, I think I'd probably agree with you on that. I, I can't really think of a time that, it was, it was in the grasp of our hands and within two minutes, it's gone. I actually remember I was in a pub that day uh, and I'm standing with one of my mates and I, and I turned around to him and I says, by the way, see that Scott McDonald? He's not actually a bad player. 
I just think he's quite a good player. And 10 minutes later, they rifled that one way out of the top corner. And I'm like, shit, should have said that. And then two minutes later, he scores again. And it was almost like disbelief. And I remember I was in I was in Sucky Hall Street in Glasgow. And I and the, the final whistle went, and I didn't say anything to any one of my mates. I got up, out, taxi, home, bed. That was it. And I was about 18 at the time. Did not speak to anybody. Stay, stay in my bed. <laughs> Went to work the next day, did not talk to anybody. So I can completely relate to how you felt at that point, Jamie. So I would probably say, I would say 100% was that day. That was absolutely gut-wrenching that day. I, pro- I can pro- I'd probably say the same, because I can't remember it. Um, I can't even really remember how I felt, to be fair. I think I was only about, I was 25 on it, so... Yeah. This is 21, so I was maybe about 10... I was maybe, I don't know, 18 years ago or something. I don't know, I was a wee guy, so... Um, for me, I'd probably say it was probably last season because um, I've seen from an early stage that it wasn't going to happen. Um, I'm not going to go into it too much, yet, but I didn't think it was going to happen anyway. I just think there was too much involved for it to... I think if we won the 10, Glasgow would have been a minefield. Um, mm-hmm. The police would have been... I just think it was. I just think it wasn't going to happen um, for other reasons for going on. But I just think that was gut wrenching on me because you hoped we sang about it and it didn't happen. And then yeah. for what we seen the way the players and how it ended, you're thinking, oh, it was just yeah. a damn squib. Um, but I probably say that for me. But when it comes to that game, as he says, <laughs> I think every Celtic fan, it's you try not to talk about it, but. Yeah, I'm sorry, Ryan. Here's, here's another one. I was just thinking there about other games that have been really emotionally affected by it. The Juventus game in their first season in the Champions League was a bad one as well. Oh, the dive. With the dive, the dive, and the guy's name was Amoruso as well. Do you remember that? The color yeah, Amoruso, mm-hmm. and you're going like, ah, fuck, is he related to that Lorenzo? Do you know what I mean? That's how bad you were feeling at the time. But the ref gave that, the referee gave that penalty. And we lost the game, and Celtic were fucking brilliant in the sand. Um, it was there was a Stadio della Alpe at the time when Juventus played in, and they were phenomenal that night. And see the referee, I watched every game that referee done going forward. I was like, that, that guy that gave us that penalty, Marcus Merck, I'll never forget his name to the day I die. <laughs> but things like that, it's, it's, it's crazy how football makes you remember certain things or certain people because of these moments that happen in the game. And, I remember, I remember I was quite young at the time when, when that happened, but I was fucking absolutely raging <laughs> that, after that game. So that's maybe another one then, other than the, the obviously the, the, the Marwell game. Um, and obviously the last few bit, Jamie, uh, to close the podcast, when is obviously the book out? Um, I know we know, but for anybody who doesn't um, know, when's the book out and any, any kind of, what's your future plans? When, kind of, any, any more maybe books ahead with Thompson or any kind of stuff that comes with um, it or anybody else in, in the future? So this book covers um, Alan being born in Battle uh, Hill, Wall's End, grown up, Viv Graham, kind of rough. Uh, his whole life, want to be a footballer, clues in the name. Um, uh, right the way through. And I would like to do one more with Alan, but I've told him that it would only start from September the... Uh, September 2000 to the day to end up with Celtic, mm-hmm. um, and it was end. Um, well, it would end now because obviously, you know, but it would purely be about Celtic. Yeah. Uh, in the greatest of respect, you know, I'm not really interested in Bolton Wonders or Hartlepool or Aston mm-hmm. Villa or England. Um, you know, so obviously, but I had to, I've had to cover that. But um, obviously, it was up to me. It would have just been Celtic. Um, you know, but I've sat with him and he's told me all these stories of who used to hang around together and golf and oh, just so many the Barrowfield stories and uh, the Martin O'Neill wind ups. And, and I said, Why didn't you tell me? And I, I would love to do a book, um, just purely on, on from 2000 to. When did he leave Celtic? 2012. But even now, mm-hmm. you know, obviously he's close to Scott Brown. Mm-hmm. Um, but obviously, I'm regarding books. I'm um, I've got a meeting with Didier Gatt in the next week or two. Um, and I, I, I you know, listen. I, uh, I mean, I'm talking to Ricky Burns when he retires. Um, 
but yeah, I wanna, I wanna um, get away from true crime, um, and, and I wanna kind of focus on football and predominantly Celtic because they're the book. If I'm honest. It's not about money. It's like, you know what? Let me. I, I'll just. Do you know what I mean? It was never about money at the start. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first, the first four books were hobbies, and uh, and that's when I thought, hang on a minute, I'm, I must, I actually must be good at this. Um, and I thought I'll have a, I'll give a go as a career, but uh, certainly one more with Thompson in two years' time. Uh, called a club like Northern, and um, I'm hoping did he get? And then, you know, I've I've reached out, I've spoken to John Hartson this year. I know he's got a couple of books out, but you know, we discussed the book on gambling addiction. Mm-hmm. Um, who else? Have I, oh, I've. I've you know, I spoke to Martin and I said, well, Martin, listen, you've had two books out, but you never actually written them. <clears throat> now, two guys written them and said, look, we want to write a book on you, Martin. They're going to happen. Please don't sue us. And uh, Martin's response was, well, Jamie, and he's like that, putting his glasses on. And he said, my discipline is appalling. It's shocking. And I'm like, I'll do it. <laughs> Um, you know, so I mean that that is, you know, um, I don't know. I mean, I've, I've spoke to Scott Brown quite a lot, and I said, listen, I can offer you a deal that could not be matched, and I, I mean that. There's no one on the planet that would that could, you know. Um, but I don't know. We'll see how far we go. Um, spoke to a lot of people over the years. Uh, Bare knuckle fighters. Um, there's a lot of boxers. Bloody Jonathan Woodgate. Um, mm-hmm. You know, so I say Alex Reed. Um, mm-hmm. oh, if I, if in a perfect world, mate, every single book would be Celtic, um, and I kind of would be known as the guy who kind of writes the Celtic books because I'm known as the maybe. <clears throat> you know, I done I done 19 books in four years to the week. And I was speaking to one of the top chief um, Scottish football reporters the other day, and he said, fucking hell, he said, you're a machine. <laughs> and I was like, that was, because I suffer from anxiety. Mm-hmm. I have good days and I have bad days. Um, so, um, you know, but that, I, I'd be, you know, I would love to just just roll them off. You know, Didier, Gat, Baldi, Scott Brown, Georgie Samaras. I would love to just do, you know, because I've, I've done a lot of people that, if I'm brutally honest, guys, they're not really nice people. Mm-hmm. Um, the interest in them is massive. You know, people are fascinated with this, the the, the psychological. I mean, I'm writing a book at the minute about Jack the Ripper, um, mm. you know, but, uh, yeah, you know, Ricky Burns, big Celtic fan, uh, great for Scottish boxing, Scotland's greatest ever have a fighter. So I'm really hoping Tom, I mean, Alan has um, given me a springboard. And he's opened a lot of doors. And as I said the last time, I'll be eternally grateful. Uh, I hope Alan gets a lot of, well, he has, you know, he's on talk sport. He's, you've seen him probably a lot. Um, he's been on Sean Atwood. Uh, he's due to be on James English in the next week mm-hmm. or so. Uh, mm-hmm. Well, um, Under the Cosh was a, Oh, 90s podcast. There's a lot of uh, every day. My my phone's constantly, mm-hmm. and uh, in the words of Oscar Wilde, there's only one thing worse than talked about, and that's not being talked about. You know, I've told them, listen, that's my job. I can do everything for you, but there's no point writing the best book in the world if you hide and you don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. So it's my job to, you, you know, you probably follow me, and um, if you're on social media. William, give me a follow. Jamie Boyle, I'll give yeah, you a follow back. Um, well, I am relentless. I mean, James English said to me a couple of years, Jamie, you're the first thing I see on the morning and the last thing I see at night. <laughs> but no one's going to come and save you. If you want to be something in yourself in life, you've got to yeah. get up and be yeah. out there. And as I said to you the last time, Ryan and Robert, if you want to make a platform and be the number one selling podcast in the world, if you're if you're doing less than two or three videos a week, you're wasting your time, yeah. um, and you've got to be hated. You've got to be the abuse, and you know I've had the worst kind of things 
said to about me, uh, but anything in a life worth doing doesn't come easy. Mm-hmm. You know, I spoke to Tomo and I said, listen, you need to be aware. And I said this from day one. <clears throat> and I said, listen, I know one half of Glasgow wanted to kill you and one loved you, but you will have the worst things. And if you can't cope with it, mate, you, there's no point doing it. You've got mm-hmm. to be... Listen, you know some of the headlines. I presume you do. Yeah. Um, yeah. Or if, you know, I'm not going to go into the book, but have a look at some of the scandals. He's been, and as I put in the back of the, the blurb, the synopsis for the book, um, Alan, Alan Thompson was known to be on the front cover of the papers as he was on the back. Mm-hmm. Or scandals, alleged, whatever. And I said, listen, they're going to use use it. Um, you know, I, I've, I've become more aware of it now because obviously I've, if you put hashtag Alan Thompson and you read some of the things and, you know, some of the things people use against him and it started on me. Um, so, you know, I'm, uh, I'm, I am I'm used to have long, long hair till this year. And uh, one thing I used to get called was a fat lesbian. <laughs> and that was one of the nice things. And I, I used to like that. But um, you, can, you can imagine what the, um, the Jazz fans think yeah. of Alan. And you could yeah. imagine Absolutely. what some of the things... And you can, you, you can imagine some of the things you're going to read in this book. What's yeah. happened? What, it's not... It's not... Um, it's not alleged. These things have happened to him and, mm. you know, and there's some people that signed for Glasgow and uh, Ali McCoy said to me, he said, listen, if you are if you do not get the Glasgow thing right, you do not play in three or four derbies. It's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. And there's lots of people have said, fuck this, I'm off. Italians, Spanish, Germans, English, lots of English people. And to play in 26 old firm games, Seven goals, which is remarkable, really, considering he was, um, he used to be known as, um, in every single one of them games, Martin played with three on the back and got on the side. So <clears throat> that was known as the grave, grave, graveyard shift. Yeah. So it was, it come natural for Didier because he was a natural athlete. He could do that. But Alan had to work at it. And it was one of, listen, Neil Lennon couldn't have played it. Uh, you know, Jackie McNamara probably couldn't have played it. You had to be up and down. And um, for a left back to score seven goals, um, just trying to think. I mean, one was a free kick, one was a penalty. So he scored five goals in open play, which is absolutely remarkable. Uh, I know he's got a record for being sent off the most times. Um, Stefan Mahe was two. I think probably there has been a few too, but Tom Rose went, listen, all my pint, I'll show you how it's done. <laughs> and he was two for two for Martin. And um, obviously Strachan's first game, you know, Tom was walking past him. Strachan can't even look at him because he's fucking raging and he's just shaking his head. And um, as, it, as he said, it doesn't get any easier. But if you want a real insight to... The, the old firm derby, whether you support Celtic or Rangers for that matter, Alan's very fair, you know, he had to be careful what he said. He mm-hmm. didn't glorify in, you know, them going under or, you know, he, he had to be careful because mm-hmm. the situations out there, that would quite frankly get him killed. Yeah. Um, so he was, you know, he, he's coming up for 48, I think now, middle-aged. And he, wasn't, he didn't want to wind anyone up, you know, but... He's he's been incredibly honest, and everything that happened about Fernando, God rest him, very very funny stories. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure you know about the turning up at each other's houses and all those kind of things. Yeah, and, yeah. You no, know, and it, it's um, I think it's what missing, even in the Rangers team and the Celtic team, you know, uh, and and Fernando, God rest him, he was uh, totally got. With the Rangers side, because he was he was to the blue side, what Alan Thompson was to the green side. One played on the left, one played on the right. So they had this rivalry for 2000 to 2006. Um, yeah, so that's you know there were a lot a lot of games when them two were literally side by side, elbows, yeah. 
everything. Um, and, and it's it's nice to listen to Tomo on on that side. Very very mm. sad he's not here. I th- you know, if he'd have been here today, I would have loved to have sent him a book. And I'm pretty sure Fernando would have laughed his head off at some of the, the antics that yeah. they used to do to each other. Yeah. Well, as I say, Jamie, it's been amazing. Uh, obviously, get your your knowledge and your obviously your your job as an author and hear more about the book, which. Again, I'm privileged to kind of hear this because some people won't even hear some of the stuff me and William have spoken about with you today. Um, I know William is, is really happy to have you on as well, um, but it's a bit yeah. late now, so um, we'll kind of call it there. But again, Jamie, thanks for coming on. I really appreciate well, listen, it. Listen, um, guys, thank you anytime. Um, I, I do suffer from anxiety, but I'm trying, um, trying I'm trying. getting that sorted. Um, but Alan, I've spoke to him at length, and he said he would be honoured to go on your podcast and um, when I meet Didier in a couple of weeks, I will certainly ask the same. So, as right. I said, I'm right. uh, a big fan of the show. I always listen when I'm in the bath for, you know, so <laughs> keep it yeah, up. And, uh, listen, there'll be haters out there. But, you know, as I said, anything in life doesn't come easy. And um, you've just got to accept it, not react. And um, because I'll just, t- <clears throat> I'll just tell you this before I go, was... Um, I was getting tagged in a load of abuse about four months ago. Um, obviously, a guy having the right go, Tomo, saying mm. some very nasty things. Uh, and I was like, oh, you know, and he was like, Jamie, what are you doing? And I was like, sticking up for you. He's like, just leave it. You know, so he's obviously used to it. Um, I'm, I don't get it a great deal on Twitter or Instagram, but I get it daily on Facebook and YouTube. I've stopped looking. Mm-hmm. But um, to be a success, I would advise you to be on all them platforms. You need to be on your mm-hmm. Spotify, YouTube, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You need to push it under everyone's nose, guys, and uh, and say, Do you know what, I'm going to have a right go at this and speak to Celtic-minded people, even people from the other side, you know. Mm-hmm. But, um, no, it's great what you do, guys, and thank you for having me on. Oh, again, Jamie, it's your pleasure. Um, again, I think... Me, Mom and Robert, I, we would definitely love to get Alan on. Hopefully we can get arranged. I know how much your hero is to us all. But again, Jamie, um, William, thanks for coming on as, as well because I know um, it's a lot of good stuff I've kind of learned like, from Jamie and his book. Um, but again, yeah. a George of Boy will be out soon. Anything. Uh, written by Jamie Boyle. Um, again, lads, thank you. Hail, hail and take care. Nice, Jamie. Cheers, guys. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Anne.